The Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not all legal activities. Listen responsibly. G'day everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max and today I'm joined by Flynn. And uh, today we're also doing it online once again. Someone in my family has got COVID. So um, yeah, we're just uh, making sure that we're not spreading the risk and um, doing an online session today. Yeah, it's twice in the start of the year. As I said with the last one, we're starting the year off with a low and here so we're doing the same thing again. Um, so hopefully we'll be back in person a lot more uh, continuing. Yeah, well, let's jump straight into it on the topic of phishing campaigns. Phishing campaigns. Flynn's got a fair amount of experience working in consulting and I've got a little bit of experience. So Flynn, why don't you start us off with this one? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about just because it's something I've been seeing a lot of misconception around recently, uh, even when running my own phishing campaigns or just delivering training. The biggest importance with phishing campaigns is educating your staff about how to look out for a phishing email. Because at the end of the day, even if you have the most secure network or system, it doesn't matter if somebody clicks a phishing email. What you want to do is first, education. Second, I would say that you want to develop a really good reporting culture and depending on how you handle a phishing internal phishing campaign you can really destroy that uh, reporting culture if you're not careful this is particularly important in smaller organizations what you want to do is you never want to actually witch hunt or have people face serious repercussions for doing a phishing campaign Uh, what i mean by that is i've seen some people if they fail the phishing campaign you know they go to them and they kind of say like oh why did you do this and the reason why you don't want to do this is because people will, A, feel bad, and then you don't want that because, you know, that could produce worse work or they could leave the company and you don't really want that. And B, it's a level of embarrassment and it takes this, makes this toxic work culture where, for example, if I clicked a phishing link and Max didn't, Max and go, oh, ha, how did you click that? You're so stupid, blah, blah, blah. You really don't want to do that because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is... Have the If somebody clicks a phishing link, you want that to be reported instantly. And if you have this sort of witch hunt mentality, if someone clicks that phishing link and they've realized it and they go, oh, I don't want to tell anyone because I'm embarrassed, that's the worst possible scenario. Yep. What you really need to have is that the reporting culture of if someone f- clicks a phishing link, they immediately contact your security team or your IT and say, hey, I think I've done something wrong. Did I click something malicious? And depending on if how you handle that, that can potentially destroy that. So you want to be really careful how you do it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And like phishing campaigns, you know, they're incredibly necessary, super important. But like you said, there's some things to look out for. Uh, some stuff that sort of I've noticed is that it's it's better off, yeah, not publicly, obviously not publicly showing, you know, who's uh, who's not doing the right thing. But Something that my company does with this is um, we try to like reward people for getting it right over and over and over again. So people who are not repeat offenders, but uh, you know ref- repeat successful phishing, uh, you know they've done all the right thing. They spotted the phishing email and they reported it and did all the right steps. People who get that right over and over again, there's some level of reward for for doing that. So it incentivizes you to always be on the lookout so you can you know potentially get something out of it. There's also the case of not making your phishing campaigns too hard because it can kind of push everything that Flynn said right into like it can be from go from a non problem where if you try and make it too hard you can really push those problems like Flynn said. Yeah, uh, that was something I actually had a problem with at work when I first started. I had made a phishing campaign and it was just it was way too difficult to the point of you would basically get anyone who that you sent it to. And my manager basically like stepped in saying like, hey, this is too difficult because you're just going to get everyone. Yeah. And the point is, is that you're not trying to slam dunk on people. You're not trying to intentionally pick people up for it. The point is, is the education piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, I would generally recommend starting with something easier so it's easy to pick up. But you do want to increase the difficulty over time. We, hopefully your employees are getting better over time. Yeah. And Accompanying this with some sort of training, I generally recommend doing in-person training rather than, you know, like e-modules just because e-modules, I don't think people absorb it very well and a lot of people just try and get through it as fast as possible. 
Yeah. There's not one way that is the best way to do fishing campaigns. I think that you have to pair it alongside a lot of other things to really get the benefit out of it. Uh, another thing before about, you know, tracking who's clicking links. Sometimes I generally recommend don't even do it at all, uh, especially with maybe your first one. It might not be worth it just seeing how many people have clicked the link, but not necessarily the people that have. But over time, of course, you're going to want to see who are the repeat offenders. How you deal with repeat offenders is a very difficult thing to do because, you know, you don't want to take any really coarse action because it's the same thing. You're going to create a toxic workplace. And, you know, obviously you're not going to fire them or something crazy like that as well. But yeah, it, if you do have a lot of repeat offenders, I think a lot of the time that may be an indicator is you need to do something different with your training. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to have the one or two people and that keep doing it. And, you know, sometimes that's just an inherent risk. What you do with those people, I can't say. Yeah, I'd say a few tips from me. In my opinion, sort of some ways that you can make it better is limit the amount of people that can actually see who are the people clicking the links so if you have a cyber team make sure it's only a couple of people that can see it like you don't especially if you're in a small company you don't want rumors to spread you don't want people to be toxic towards each other you don't want any you know semblance of that information escaping from those who actually really need to know it and in the case of repeat offenders as well the thing that's sort of important like you can automate the whole process so that if someone just doesn't get it right three times in a row they're just um signed up to training or you know it's automated that they have to go into yep. training that way you know you're limiting how many people see it in general and also you can yeah make sure that those people are, are getting the education they need but it's it's a tricky sort of uh balance because you don't want to embarrass them that's the worst thing you want to do like you don't want someone to click on the thing and go oh i'm such a detrimental anchor to our company right you don't want them to feel terrible I have to go to this training now. Everyone's going to think I'm an idiot. So, you know, it, it's important to balance it out and to uh, to make sure that people are getting the education, but they're not feeling bad for being in a state where they might need a little extra help. Yeah, I think that you've always got to keep in mind with everything cyber really is, what is the benefit, particularly with education? What is the best way I'm going to have people absorb this? Because, you know, people are the first line of defense and you really need to have people on their game they can be an invaluable asset into picking up cybersecurity issues and they can also be a massive detriment to your security often the latter but it's a conversation for another day yeah uh just i wanted to quickly ask as well max with the incentives you said so is that based on people that report it or is it just people who don't click it no so people who don't click it are actually put in a separate bucket so it's people who okay. saw it notice that it's phishing but then they didn't go through the entire process and uh report it so only the people who are seeing the emails noticing that they're phishing not clicking on it and then reporting it to the company so doing everything perfect as you would in a real phishing uh scenario people are doing that over and over again i can't remember how many times that they had to get it right but there's some uh, reward going on at my company for that which i think is a good way to okay. do it because at that point as well, you're incentivizing people to study up and try and get it right. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say it would be an interesting way to do it because, you know, what if you just have people that are not doing their job well, they're not even looking at emails, <laughs> and then they get rewarded for it. Yeah. But um, I think that's a good way to do it. All right. So we'll move on to our next topic, which is a little bit on OSINT, a little bit on digital footprint. Like this is a more of a sort of, standard topic we're just going to chat a little bit about what are some of the things that you can do to protect yourself online with your accounts and social media particularly but just general things you can do to um, lower the chance of people being able to track you down i might start and just say a couple things it's really important to private your all of your social media accounts like people think oh it doesn't really matter who's gonna look at my stuff but you'd be very very surprised a picture of your backyard can very easily give you away and actually give your um, house away and the location of your house. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't realize how much is online. You posting it or whether, you know, it's your fa friends and family posting it. By the way, one thing I'll say is to friends and family, be careful of what you are posting of, you know, your 
relatives. I've seen a lot of people posting a lot of like pictures of their kids, which, you know, might be wholesome sometimes, but you kind of do have to think in this day and age, what are the repercussions? I think we spoke last week about the AI enhancing and scary stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it really is something scary. I think a lot of people need to keep it in mind a lot more. Yeah. And, and um, like, if you're listening to this podcast as well, obviously you have an interest in cybersecurity somewhat. So take that leap and make sure that you're protecting the people around you, being involved in your community and making sure that if you see some, someone's post or see someone's account and you notice that they're giving away some information they don't really need to, might be a good idea to just, you know, send them a, a nice message and say, hey, I've, you know, got an interest in cybersecurity, just notice you posted this. Might be a good idea for you to change it or to um, to blur out some, some certain things. Simple things like that can really help people out. There's obviously varying uh, success rates with OSINT. You can generally figure something out about everyone, but, you know, some people have their whole life online and some people will be more private. Yeah. But it is it is often a initial attack vector for hackers as well into organizations. Even anything, you look up Microsoft online, you're going to be able to find employees there, which then can lead to a phishing campaign or maybe can lead to finding a particular vulnerability. Yeah. I'll just... Uh, have a quick example we were doing work for a company one time and they do like fairly important work with the government basically two news outlets released statements on the company one of them had released a statement and they redacted the signature of the ceo and the other one did the same thing but they didn't redact the information of the ceo that was i mean that, that took me about five minutes of osin and having that you could do some fraud easily where he's um, impersonate someone with their signature. Yeah, exactly. And it's sometimes you can't help it. It's just, it comes down to that at the end of the day. Luckily, we told them about that and they immediately got in contact with that um, news outlet and said like, hey, can you please remove that? Yep. But yeah, sometimes you can't help it. It's a, That's cybersecurity in a nutshell, but you just got to reduce your attack vector as much as possible. Some other little fun tips as well I thought I'd bring up is... When you're leaving reviews for places, use a burner account. Don't use your real um, account if you're leaving reviews that have your name in it. Because, you know, at a certain level, you're giving away, you know, say, for example, you're leaving a review for a, a cafe you frequently visit, right? People are able to see, okay, this person left a review and it's a review saying, I love coming here every day. Well, then they're going to know where you are at every day, right? They're going to know that you're visiting that place at least once a day. Or it's a, it's a frequent spot for you. So yeah, using burner accounts. Generally, my rule of thumb is, yeah, don't leave reviews for places where you live, like places near where you live. I wouldn't even interact with any posts if, say, you lived in San Francisco, right? It would be unwise to follow pages and follow, you know, uh, Facebook pages or anything that can be found out from someone else. Pages about San Francisco or about your you know, local school in San Francisco. Like, these are all things that are slowly, you know, increasing how much information is being added to your digital footprint online. Yeah, that that's something that really only if you're aware of it, you're going to not do that. That's something that basically everyone's going to do. And it goes to show that you can find out a lot about people. If you do want to know more about OSINT, Max has created a short in the past uh, before we were the Cyber Minutes podcast but it's still on the youtube channel if you want to check it out yeah check it out it should be called how to do osin in one minute or it's it's if you go into the youtube channel scroll back to the shorts i think it's the very first video there it's um it's a pretty good watch so i just did some geo int which is finding a video of a house on youtube finding some camera angles that gave away some key landmarks in the video and from that i was able to you know pretty easily triangulate where that video was taken so, yeah, it's just a thing to keep in mind. Also, don't freak yourself out about it. About it. We're not trying to scare you with this. I think some people get it way too caught up in their brains. What if someone's tracking me? What if someone's tracking me? And, you know, it's not worth becoming a hermit as well. You don't have to wipe yourself off the internet. Um, but it's just, you know, there's some things you can do to uh, minimize the amount of um, exposure that you have. Yeah, exactly. It's just something about being aware of it, but... um. You know, you don't have to get stuck in paranoia, I suppose. It was actually quite a while ago, I was privy to seeing a tool 
where basically it was a dark web monitoring tool. And I just wanted to talk about it because me and Max were having a conversation about ransomware gangs and, you know, dark web marketplaces. And what I thought was really cool about this tool is that it showed you live ransomware attacks on companies. Um, obviously, I won't see the tool or any companies that I saw in there, but it was really eye-opening to how you know widespread and you could see the particular gangs that were doing it. It was often the same ones, you know, the real big players in there. And it goes back to something I always say to companies when I go in there and talk about ransomware, is that ransomware is a business. And it's a very lucrative one of that. It's not going anywhere anytime soon unless someone figures out a way to completely stop it, which isn't going to happen. It's not going to be going anywhere. You know, we've spoken in the past of don't interact with them. But ransomware, at the end of the day, is a business that earns a lot of money. And I just wanted to bring that up because it was pretty shocking seeing how widespread it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, like you really hit the nail on the head. It's a business. It's a multi-billion dollar business you know, every year, I think something like $11 billion just in Australia was lost to ransomware. So I'm not sure exactly how that stat was calculated, but, you know, that's a lot of money and there's a real drive for people to try and put resources into ransomware. So, yeah, it's, it's still worth, you know, keeping an eye on it, making sure that your defenses are up. And, yeah, that, that's a cool tool, though. I wish I could <laughs> use that. Yeah, I think it was a bit in the morally grey area. We decided to not end up using it because of that reason. Yeah, I think um, there's probably quite a few tools flying around that are in the grey area, let's just say. I mean, really, all this tool was doing was, you know, collating a bunch of information on the dark web. You could probably go do it yourself. You know, granted, you would have to be pretty adept at traversing the dark web, which that's a skill once skill. you know how to... Yeah, once you know how to do it, I don't think it's too difficult, but it's about figuring out those initial stages. And you want obviously know. doing it can be scary. If you also, I'll add on that as well. If you want to check out how you can use the dark web, you heard, uh, you know, I've heard of the dark web, but I don't know how to get there. There is, I also made a video on that. <laughs> so you can, um, you can check that out on the YouTube channel. Uh, I think I said it a lot, but, you know, be diligent if you go ahead and try to use it. Make sure to, uh, yeah, uh, just, Keep your eyes open. We're plugging all of Max's YouTube shorts yep. today. Yeah, today is the <laughs> um, YouTube shorts day. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is globally, uh, if the revenue growth pace is maintained at that level, ransomware actors will make just short of $900 million from victims in 2023. And remember, that figure is probably majorly deflated because there's going to be so many people that don't report it. So um, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. I've said it before as well, if you hit the basics, especially with backups, ransomware becomes much less of a threat. So um, it can be sort of expensive like using like immutable backups and stuff like that, uh, making sure you can restore. Also be aware that there are, if there's double, triple, at some point there were only 10 uh, extortion methods. I saw one recently, so we, we covered the... Um, going to the regulators one i saw recently as well which i'm shocked that it took this long for actors to do this was that they're actually swatting the business as well really so they would uh yeah so they would do the initial ransomware and then they would basically say hey we're doing this so those of you who don't know what swatting is basically it's when you call law enforcement and um basically impersonate that you've got a bomb threat or you know you're an active shooter or something like that and that law enforcement obviously is going to take that very seriously, come to your location, and then, you know, if you're a company, they're going to basically kick down the door and say, hey, what is going on here? And that can be very disruptive. It can also be very traumatic. Is something that used to happen a lot with, like, Twitch streamers and YouTubers and stuff like that. Really, like, low-level stuff. It goes to show that extortion, there's going to be another way that comes out of it eventually as well. But if you hit the basics well, you're probably going to be okay for the most part. Obviously nothing is risk-free uh i guess just quickly something we'll touch on is the there was another atlassian bug which allowed for remote code execution in out-of-date versions of confluence data centers or confluence servers so if you've got any of those uh, atlassian are very urgently recommending that you upgrade your systems update them to the latest version because it has been patched so it's been patched out 
but it's a yeah it's a, a pretty bad vulnerability yeah so those who are not so technical remote code execution is basically the worst you can get you can basically do anything on a system if you can do remote code execution yeah uh, a good example yeah. that i we, i try to use is imagine you have a box or a button that lets you upload files onto a system and what if that button didn't just say oh you only need to upload pdfs or word documents what if it said you could upload anything and you upload uh some malware or, or a um or a virus or something that so that would be an example of um remote code execution so uh yeah you just just worth um updating your stuff if you haven't already interestingly enough that vulnerability was found in a bug bounty so what a bug bounty is is it's just a little thing that companies do where they give usually cash prizes to people who can find vulnerabilities in their systems so in this case someone found pretty much the worst of the worst in their systems so they would have got a um a, a hefty sum out of it yeah it's a quite a big sort of side hustle in the security community you can do it full-time but it requires a lot of you know skill and also just knack for the trade i've heard a couple stories uh, particularly on darknet diaries about uh, i can't remember what the guy's name was but he used to basically always be looking at the news and as soon as he saw one vulnerability he would instantly go across multiple different companies testing if he could get it done that was one of my goals i think in 2022 was to get at least one bug bounty i didn't really care about sort of the money behind it i just wanted to do it to say i had done it fortunately uh my goals changed. I ended up starting a new job at the time, so I didn't end up doing it. But um, it is definitely something to check out. It's something that's really cool for people getting into cybersecurity. Honestly, you're probably not going to find something straight away uh, if you're new, but it is something that you can sort of look forward to, look towards uh, while you kind of do the basics like capture the flags and stuff like that. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.